Okay, Assalamualaikum and um, welcome back to um, all the participants um, to the afternoon session of the first day of the Research Proposal Optimization Workshop. I am Nora Fiza, I'll be uh, moderating uh, the session this afternoon. Um, I think before, um, so before we start, I'm pretty sure everyone know um, Dr. Zaleha um, very well. Um, she's a well-known figure from uh, Department of Public Health Medicine. So, uh, Associate Prof. Uh, Dr. Zaleha is the Head of Department of Public Health uh, Medicine um, Department at, at present. And um, today, she will be talking about um, the clinical methodology because we already had the uh, basic science uh, methodology earlier by AP Dr. Zaleha. So, we will have another talk on clinical research methodology before dispersing to the respective mentoring session. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to invite um, Dr. Zaleha uh, to give a talk. Okay, thank you very much Dr. Pija for the introduction. Okay, um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good afternoon. So today I'm going to talk on the clinical methodology. Um, some of the slides may be overlapping with uh, other speaker just now, so it made me uh, easier to explain. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, first of all, why we need a proper methodology in writing a research proposal? Because uh, in writing a proper methodology, we allow can allow readers to evaluate the, uh, the validity and reliability of our research. And also, it can explain the data that have been collected to answer the research problem. Whether our research, our methodology can answer the research problem, and also the research objective that we have stated in our uh, proposal. So, uh, when we go specifically to the uh, methodology section, actually, it should have all this, but it's a very uh, extensive. But some of the um, uh, proposal is not need to include all these 13, um, I mean, 13 items. But at least we need to have this for the study design, uh, study location or study period. That's the basic thing we need to put in. And start inclusion, exclusion criteria, the sample size estimation, sampling method, how we are going to sample our uh, subjects. And how are we going, who, where, when, and what, and how we are going to uh, do a data collection. And also, we need to mention about our research tool, our instrument that we use, whether it is valid or reliable to be used in our proposal. And of course, some of the many of the uh, grant proposal they need to uh, have a study flow chart, and also the plan of the data entry and statistical analysis. And not to forget about the ethical issues and consideration because we need, uh, in whatever way, we need to have uh, to fill in our um, uh, research ethics. I mean, uh, form right. So this is uh, talking about the uh, research design. Commonly, people talk about research design, whether it's a therapeutic research, where uh, we have a. Uh, and we have to enroll the subject with a specific treatment to test its outcome. This therapeutic maybe involve more of the clinical studies. Or we can have a prognostic research uh, in where we have to understand and predict the future clinical outcome, for example, a specific disease. So the study design that should be involved in this uh, prognostic research uh, can be a cross-sectional and also prospective cohort. And we have a diagnostic research Diagnostic research means more of the estimating the sensitivity and specificity of individual diagnostic tests. For example, sometimes we call it the, the study design is the cross-section. This is a, a, a research design, eh? it's not the study design. And some, uh, we call it a theologic research, which is um, we have to, we need to determine the causal relationship between the uh, risk factors and a given disease outcome. So this normally involves a lot uh, like cross-sectional, case control, cohort study, uh, and either retrospective or prospective cohort. So uh, I think it, um, 
just now we we can see that uh, AP Dr. Suhaila also mentioned about this uh, medical research, the, the types of uh, medical related research. We have a primary research and secondary research. So the clinical research mainly in this area, right? So I, I'm going to uh, touch a little bit also on the epidemiology research because clini in clinical setting, some of you uh, might uh, um, conduct uh, epidemiology research. This is the common research uh, methodology that we need to uh, have. Okay. So in another um, simple, simplest way that medical related research, we have a primary, a secondary, and we have a clinical, clinical trial and epidemiology. Just now, um, Epi Dr. Saila mentioned more of this uh, part the basic of your research. So we are talking more, now I'm going to talk more on this uh, area, okay, up to this area, okay. Okay, um, so this is another way. There's many ways actually uh, people talk about the study design. Uh, uh, the sim this is a very simplest way. P normally people just talk about the analytical and descriptive. The descriptive mainly among the clinician, they use a case report, case series of descriptive survey and also qualitative study. But for the analytical, we have an experimental study and observational study. Experimental means more of a clinical trial or lab trial and also a field trial. And uh, for the observational, we have a cross-sectional case control and a cohort. That's a commonly that we use. Okay. So uh, if same thing here, same thing, analytical, experimental and observational, for example, did uh, the, the question that we can ask, whether did the investigator assign the exposure? Yes, no. So if yes, then it's going to be under experimental if no that is under the observational study so if under experimental study uh, do we allow the random allocation if yes then we call it a randomized control trial if not then it's non-randomized control trial for the observational study if we have a, com a comparison group uh, then we be more detailed. If do not have uh, the uh, comparison group, it's just end up at a descriptive study. So if we have a, a comparison group, we need to see the direction whether you would like to see the um, uh, exposure to the outcome that either can be cohort, case control, or cross-sectional. Okay, all this... Um, a study design depends on the research question, actually. So in order to determine the study design, we need to have a proper research uh, uh, question first. Then we can uh, have uh, we can decide which study design that we would like to choose. For example, uh, for under therapy, let's say we would like to determine the uh, effectiveness of the treatment. It could be under the randomized control trial. So for the diagnosis, for example, how good is this test in detecting the disease? For example, so it it, should, it can be a cross sectional with a blind comparison to the gold standard. For example, it can be prospective. For prognosis, so maybe uh, the question is what are the factors that predict the outcome? So it could be the prospective cohort or case control study. So for the etiology, like what causes a disease? So it could be a cohort or case control. So we go to specific uh, cross-sectional study design. How uh, how this cross-sectional study design looks like? So. Um, Initially, we started with the population and we, we, we have a target population, then we have a sample of population. When we have a group of sample population, then we divide it into the exposed and unexposed. And then we follow up on, or it's not necessary follow up, we can uh, have a look at the, the outcome and no outcome. And also in, in ex, unexposed group, we have uh, a see the uh, outcomes and no outcome. So the risk of outcome in exposed group, later on we, we can have this and also risk of outcome in our exposed group. So this is a cross-sectional study. So in another words, um, also I don't have another slide, it's okay. For the case control study, uh, let's say we have a case, we have a control, and then our stand is here. 
So we, 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 if we're standing here, we have a control, we have a case, but we look at their history, whether they have been exposed to the, uh, for example, the smoking and lung cancer. So we have a patient with a lung cancer and we have a patient without a lung cancer. So we go back, we go back. Uh, uh, looking at their history, their past, whether they have, uh, 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 they are smoker or not, whether the smoker is exposed and now smoker is unexposed. Same thing. This one is a smoker. This is a non-smoker. So we are standing here. So we 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 ask the uh, retrospectively. So we call it that because we have a case and control. Then we call it a case control study. Okay, this is a cohort study. We have uh, two types of cohort study, either retrospective or we call it a historical. And then we have another one is a prospective cohort. So if a retrospective cohort, we're standing here, okay, and then we have a new, uh, we have an outcome. Among those who have uh, exposure, either we have a uh, cases or non-exposure, we have a new cases, so we can we can see the, the factors or the uh, factors associated with it. So it's a cohort study, retrospective a cohort study, because we are looking backwards. In the uh, prospective cohort, we are standing here before we conduct a study, some sort of, at the beginning of the study. So we have a population. We, 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 we choose a study sample and then we screen for healthy people. So those who have an illness, we already exclude them. And then from the healthy people, we follow up them. Whether those who have exposure will get a disease or those without exposure will get a disease. So this, we follow up to the future. So this is a prospective cohort, right? So another... Um, um, Another study design that um, some people might use is a nested case control study. It's, it's a, actually, it's a cohort study, but we do it a case control on top of the cohort study because at the beginning, we choose a population and we choose a people without a disease and then we look at the uh, outcome, whether they have a disease or no disease. But um, in let's say uh, our follow-up may take about 10 years, but uh, within five years, we would like to see the, the result, for example. So we just take those without the case, uh, have a disease, and those without a disease as a control. So we conduct it here, and then we call it a nested case control. So the case control on top of the cohort study. This is a randomized control trial. Okay. First of all, we have a recruitment of the subjects. And then we see the eligibility of the assessment. Of course, you have to have a inclusion, exclusion criteria. And then we do a randomization and then we can go into the intervention arm or control arm. So, and then in the intervention, of course, you will give the uh, drug or any procedures, but in the control arm, nothing happened. You just give a placebo, maybe. It's not a, 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 a drug for treatment. And then you follow up later on, we analyze it. And then you compare the result. Okay. Another thing about the blinding in the uh, randomized control trial. We have, you have, you need to mention also, you not just mention about the uh, randomized control trial, but you have to mention whether uh, you have an open label or double blinding, single blinding, and the triple blinding. So it's not just mention about the uh, randomized control trial, but you need to mention whether it's open label or single blinding or double blinding and so on. So you must you must really understand what you are doing, whether it's, it's, it's open label or which is uh, you do not have um, uh, you do not have a blinding at all. So both the uh, uh, subjects and the investigator know what is being given. Okay. Um, and then about the study period and location. Uh, yeah, I think in, in our research uh, proposal form also, I mean, the uh, research proposal that we need to submit to ethics committee or whatever, we need some time to put the uh, study period or study location. Of course, there's already a location uh, uh, elements there. So you need to mention where you would like to study and then um, 
what uh, maybe it involves some of the group whether it's occupation or whatever right and then talking about the reference population so for the for the uh sometimes because when you do a study you would like to refer back your finding right so let's say uh, for example you would you would like to study the undergraduate uh, student uh, year three for example uh, and then you would you you when you do a proper methodology when you do a proper selection you can infer back the result to the whole population of undergraduate medical student in fact so the reference population here becomes the undergraduate student in malaysia but your study population or your source population only from year three in selected university if you do a proper selection uh like a um I mean, simple, random, or whatever. You can you can say that your study can infer back to the whole population. Um, for example, in our medical student also, let's say you would like to study um, uh, a certain um, lifestyle behavior among our medical student. You cannot afford to have all the year one from year five, for example. So maybe you just select. Um, representative from from uh, each of the uh, a year for example so the source population is the um, selected population from the uh, every year but the reference population you can refer it to the whole undergraduate medical student in the UITM for example in medical school right and a study participant about the inclusion and exclusion criteria. I think most of you knows what is inclusion, the characteristic of the subject that need to be included in the study. But exclusion criteria, those characteristics that disqualify the prospective subject from the inclusion. But some, um, many of uh, us did a mistake because we, sometimes the inclusion we put it is, and then the exclusion is the mirror image of the uh, uh, exclusion. So, for example, you say that our inclusion is male, but your exclusion is female. So, it's wrong. Yeah, It's not the mirror image. So, you must say something else. So, of course, uh, sometimes people put that uh, those who give a consent uh, in exclusion criteria but the exclusion those who did not give a consent so cannot you have to have uh, something that's unique it's not the, the the mirror image of the inclusion to be the in the exclusion criteria and then uh coming back coming to the, the sample size the, 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 the determination okay in whatever study try as much as possible to calculate the sample size why we need to calculate the sample size because we would like to see whether uh, your study is feasible or affordable for you to do it or is it biologically plausible is it ethical or is it meaningful yeah sometimes you would like to study um it's a big study but you just do it among maybe uh 10 uh, or 20 people so maybe it's not it's not uh, the number is not good enough for you to interpret or for you to analyze it so you have to calculate your sample size yeah and then guide this is the guide on the sample size uh, uh, estimation first of all you need to have a good objective so write a objective you need to have a study design and then need to consider your main outcome or dependent variable how many numbers of outcome okay this is dependent and dependent variable you did because in order to calculate a sample size you need to calculate your sample size based on objective if you have three objectives then your sample size should be calculated for each of the objective and then the biggest sample size will be taken as your sample for your study so you cannot just let's say for example the first one you study to determine the prevalence of diabetics among uh, staff of your ITM, for example. And then uh, second, uh, to determine the association between the uh, social demographic factors and the uh, diabetics. And then you just calculate the first one, uh, prevalence, but you didn't calculate about the, um, uh, the to determine the factor. For example, you want to compare the prevalence between male and female. 
So, of course, if you just calculate the prevalence, uh, overall prevalence, maybe uh, the, the numbers um, that you get cannot be implied to the second objective. For example, your second objective is to determine the um, uh, what the, the, the prevalence among male and female. So maybe uh, by, by not calculating the uh, second objective, you might have, uh, later on, you might have the, maybe female prevalence is uh, 20%. Uh, the male prevalence is 30%, for example. So when you want to analyze, it's not, uh, the sample is not enough. It's not enough for you to, to interpret later on. So you need to calculate every objective. So uh, this is uh, the sim uh, to show how are you uh, choose the sample size calculation based on the methods and objective. First of all, to determine the type of study design and objective of your research and you have a study outcome. And then are you comparing a group or are you not comparing a group? Sorry, this one not comparing, right? So if you use a proportion, for example, the prevalence, so you use a single proportion is just to determine the prevalence of diabetic among uh, staff of your ITM. So you use a single proportion. Proportion. If you would like to compare, let's say the compare the prevalence of uh, diabetic among uh, male and female, then you use a two proportion formula. All right. So uh, this is uh, sorry, eh? this is lah nikasi ini. So this, uh, for example, you would like to determine the um, uh, blood pressure level, for example, the blood pressure, uh, systolic blood pressure among male and female. So the, the blood pressure level is a numerical variable. It's a continuous variable. So we use a mean. That's why we need to have a single mean for the, let's say you would like to determine the mean uh uh, the mean blood pressure level among your ITM staff. Of course, you need to use a single mean. Let's say you would like to compare the, the blood pressure between male and female, then you use a two-mean formula. Yeah. So, uh, each of objective, that's why each object, let's say this is objective one. So, you have an, an, another sample. Objective two, another number of sample. Same thing here. So, if you have a three objective, you will have a three three different sample size. But which one you should take as your whole uh, sample or your study? So you need to take the biggest one, right? So this is the uh, met. Okay, this is the study design and the uh, sample size. This is to show the sampling methods. So how are you going to select your sample? Let's say you have a medical student of 1,000 medical students. Okay, you would like to study that your sample size calculated only, uh, maybe you need only 300. So how are you going to select 300 out of 500 medical students or out of 1,000 medical students? So you have to uh, show how are you going to select whether the selection can, can uh, can represent the whole population of 1,000 medical students. So in the sampling method, we have what we call it a non-probability sampling and also probability sampling. The best one is a probability sampling because by using a probability sampling, you have a, a, the subject will have an equal chance to be selected. Uh, okay. So either by simple random cluster sampling or systematic sampling and also stratified random sampling. For the uh, non-probability sampling, uh, as much as possible, you try to avoid using the non-probability sampling because it's not uh, represent sometimes because you just purposefully uh, take the sample. It might not represent the whole population of your study. So uh, in, in, in by doing that, you having difficulty in info back to the whole population. Okay, so the non-probability sampling, sometimes we call it a convenient, uh, convenient, sorry, eh? convenient sampling, judgmental or purposive sampling or snowball sampling and a quota sampling. So this is the best one, okay, the probability sampling. Okay. Um, the blinding just now, eh? the blinding of the, um, um, 
in the randomized control trial or in a community trial, in a free trial, it depends on the type of the trial. Eh? Whether it's participant being treated, clinical staff or investigator, administrating team. Okay, I, I did mention just now about the single blind, double blind, triple blind. So all this should be involved, right? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, sorry, slide ni patut duduk depan lagi tadi. So, I've mentioned just now about the blinding. Okay, and then the data collection. The data collection actually is a systematic approach to gather the relevant information from a variety of sources, right? Uh, the data collection either as primary data collection or secondary data collection. The primary normally you, you, you yourself collect data by doing a primary data collection but secondary normally like for example you collect a data from medical record from the database that already uh, present so it's a secondary data so the tools tools normally we use a questionnaire like interview reporting or you use a case study checklist observation or focus group so in your methodology if you use a questionnaire you have to describe whether your questionnaire is a valid or reliable let's say uh, for example you use questionnaire uh, you you adopt the questionnaire from english version but you would like to do uh, you would like to test a questionnaire in among the malay population it's not translated so even though your study population can speak well english or can write or read in english but sometimes because this questionnaire is from the um, from the other population group for example from the united states for example from the uh, um, uh, English, British English, for example. So it might not suitable for our uh, Malaysian population, even though we we use the same language, English language. But sometimes you have to do some sort of um, uh, reliability testing, for example, whether it is suitable or not. Right? For the interviews, for example, even though you use interview, but you need to have some sort of um, um, uh, what we call it a uh, checklist or uh, items that you would like to interview because you interview sometimes different people right so you you need to have a standard format a standard uh, guideline on the interview okay study variable and operational definition some of the uh, proposal you might need to include this if your um, if your operational definition or if you use some terminology or some variable that um, uh, you would like to study it's not the same as the uh, common one for example we have a standard but you would like to uh, use a little bit different from others so you need to mention here Okay, describe exactly what the variables and how they are measured within the context of your study. For example, the obesity, for example, some people use the WHO uh, definition for obesity, the classification. Some of people would like to use the um, Asian uh, classification. So you have to mention that your obesity in your study actually according to uh, WHO or according to the uh, uh, Asian uh, classification, for example. Okay, and the study flow chart. Okay, um, there is no specific template for this uh, flow chart actually, but um, commonly people talk about the uh, starting from the uh, uh, sampling procedure. So sampling procedure, data collection process, and then at the end. Uh, we have the analysis. It depends. Some of the uh, people put the according to the population, for example, which group uh, you want to uh, um, what to to to, um, to select the sample, and then later uh, whether it goes into the arm, right arm, or I mean uh, intervention arm, or um, the uh, control arm, so ever. So, for example, here. For example, we have, uh, let's say, we have the older uh, population and then uh, the older population treated by gastroenterologists, for example, and then you identify whether they're able to give a consent or not. So if not, then you exclude. And then if yes, you give an informed consent and then 
uh, whether uh, they can accept or not, whether yes, if yes, then you put in your study inclusion. And then, for example, here you give a questionnaire, whatever, then if they answer a questionnaire, they agree to take a blood, so the venous arterial blood will continue, and later on you will do the uh, clinical evaluation, and then later you will discharge another admission. All this, all this flow, what you are going to do in your study, you have to mention it. Okay, some people, uh, maybe they give just like an N as an assess for eligibility, okay, how many? And then excluded how many, and you randomize how many, then you allocate to the intervention group, allocate to the control group, and then you follow up. Okay, how are you going to follow up? It depends. Okay, you 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 can think whether which one is more suitable to to give the view to the uh, panel of assessor to make it clear whether uh, your study is really uh, in in order you know it's not uh, you have to jump here and there right so and then coming back to the uh, statistical uh, analysis or statistical test some um, some people they just write very uh, simple okay um the study, the data will be entered into SPSS version, whatever. Sometimes version also is all version. We already have uh, up to 28 version, but you're, you still put the 16 version, for example, SPSS. So you have to mention that data will be entered in SPSS and the analysis. They just mention analysis accordingly or whatever. But you have to think uh, more uh, into the, you have to plan. When you have the outcome, how are you going to analyze it? For example, uh, in etiologic study, for example, you either you would like to use a multivariable analysis or you would like to use just a descriptive analysis, right? It depends on the uh, your dependent and independent variable. So you have to mention because sometimes it's, it's more easy for you to look at your objective. Okay, for example, uh, the first objective is to determine the prevalence. So maybe it's just a descriptive because you just determine the prevalence. But uh, if the not, another objective mentioned about to determine the factors associated. So maybe you need, uh, if you want to determine the factors associated or you, you would like to determine the predictors, determinant, of course you need to do a multivariate analysis and it depends on your outcome, whether your outcome is... Uh, um, outcome or independent variable is numerical or is a categorical for example is categorical if two category then you use the uh, multipologistic regression if you have a, a single outcome with a numerical variable maybe you use a multiple linear regression and you have uh, for example uh, you have a uh, more than two category of the outcome variable maybe you use the uh, um, uh, what we call it the um uh, the um um like here is uh if you use the continuous you call uh mancova or um, uh, repeated measure anova if you use the uh, uh pre and post for example so only you you need to have uh, that in uh, your proposal so even though by doing this a bit hard for some of the uh uh, some of the researchers a bit hard to think of the analysis because uh, they would like to do it at last. But actually, it helped you a lot, you know, when you, you think the uh, analysis or the statistical analysis in, at the beginning in your proposal, later on, it's much, much, much easy for you to analyze or do or some uh, discussion and so on. So better for you to think now, right? Okay, this is another common statistical test used in intervention study where either you use a one numeric one numerical dependent variable or repeated match. You use a, a just now I mentioned if pre and post, or you use a few times measurement, then you use a repeated measure, uh, uh, repeated measure ANOVA. If you has a more two numerical variable, there's another. Uh, statistical analysis, whether they use on nominal or ordinal, all this you have to think uh, in your proposal. Okay. And I think um, 
AP Dr. Saila also mentioned about this gunshot and milestone. Same thing with the clinical epidemiology. You also uh, write your gunshot and milestone. And not to forget about the ethical principles. Okay, ethical principle, you should be honest. You should be uh, have objectivity, avoid bias, integrity, especially in clinical methodology. If you uh, need to take a blood or need to take a specimen from the patient and so on. So you have to be uh, very, um, you need to have integrity on that. Tak boleh nak sorok-sorok lah kan. Okay, carefulness, openness, respect for intellectual properties, confidentiality, competence and also legality. So all this need to be considered, especially in doing the uh, control trial. Okay, I think that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, AP Dr. Zaleha. I, um, we have a question from AP Dr. Bahia. This one, Prof. Uh, we only, Salam Prof. Zaleha, we only include the calculation for the sample size that we shall use, the larger sample size only, right, in the proposal? Uh, yes, but sometimes you need to mention that uh, we have calculated for all three objectives, but the biggest sample size obtained from this objective. So you mentioned that also can. But sometimes uh, you need to mention that you have calculated for all three objectives. Okay, and then Epi Dr. Tuhaira asked, um, when would the non-probability sampling method be valid to be used in the research method? Uh, actually, it's a valid. It's valid. It can be used, but sometimes you cannot infer back. It's, it's mm -hmm. not really uh, good to infer back because you are using the non-probability sampling. The best way is probability sampling because your sample is a representative, you know. The, that means you, uh, your population have equal chance to be selected. But while you're doing the non-probability, it's just like you just take it. Whether, whether, we are not sure whether your sample is really represent the whole population. It's still valid. You can use it. But sometimes because in, in certain situation, due to logistic, due to the difficulty in getting the uh, subject, then you need to use the non-probability sampling. I would like to ask you oh, yeah. further. Yeah. yeah thank, thanks, bro, uh, Professor, yeah. for clarifying this one. So, which means that uh, if, let's say, um, they do use the, uh, the non-probability sampling, um, that's still okay. Um, okay. Or would that be scrutinized juga? Yes. And, and they would suggest for uh -huh. probability sampling. Yes. So, so which one? Um, because you said ideally it should be probability and sampling. Yes. Um, but of course the non-probability sampling um, looks to be a simpler approach. Mm. Mm. So yeah. a lot of people would be skewed to going for non-probability. Non <laughs> so how do we decide uh, what, which one would be, you know, better for us or, or in terms, I don't know, whether later on to publish data, uh, that would be... As much as possible, try to get the probability sampling first. Okay. You okay. In your proposal, you have to plan that you are going for probability sampling. Let's say later on, you cannot get the sample using a probability sampling that you have planned, then you go for non-probability sampling. Okay, so I presume, yeah. uh, so if, if let's say it's a disease that's quite rare, uh -uh. that might be something that you might want to go for a non-probability where yeah. the, the punya prevalence is not that high. Yes, uh, that's one you, you you okay. have to you are the you are the judgment lah that mm -hmm. this not, cannot be a probability. Then you use non-probability. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tuhaira. Um, any other question from the participants? If I may ask, uh, Dr. Zaleha, mm. um, how detailed would be the detail that we have to put in the proposal? Uh, you mean the, the of the what? Methodology. 
the methodology actually uh, it depends on the type of your study lah. okay it depends uh, when people not in your area look at your methodology they know what you are doing to do what you're going to do so sometimes you yourself you think oh it's not it's already enough you know mm -hmm. but you have to think that other people not in your field so by 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 reading your proposal sometimes they cannot understand you that means something that's why when when we prepare the uh, uh proposal try ask our colleague which not in the area to read at your proposal maybe that will help you lah. And I guess um, because whatever the methodology, it should be reflected in the executive summary as well. Yes. Uh, so it has to be tweaked to the executive summary like or... Uh, uh, in executive summary, yeah. you are not going to write a detail, right? Yeah. You just write um, like uh, maybe one or two sentences of methodology, but in general, but people would like to see more in detail yeah. later on in your methodology. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions coming. Uh, so I uh, thank I would like to thank you very much um to AP Dr Zaleha for spending her time, um for our proposal um research proposal optimization workshop. Uh, thank you very much again, Dr Zaleha. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, before we disperse to our uh, respective mentoring session, um, Dr. AP Dr Tahirah would like to uh, take a few minutes to uh, say something. I will also share. Uh, the CPD uh, QR code again as well. Okay, Dr. Thayra. Okay, thank you so much for giving me this platform. Um, this is just to sort of, I forgot to, when I was giving my, my opening remarks, to highlight that this research optimization workshop is really a very close, uh, clo a small group um, workshop, to be honest. It's very targeted. Um, and uh, I think what, what, what's consisting here is about 19 participants uh, representing the proposals uh, that were submitted to FMRG um, that we want to enhance so that we can resubmit them. Uh, so, and, and again, this is um, a pilot uh, run to see how, how well it works. And we prefer this clo uh, closer um, small group session so that you can have uh, more focus with um, uh, participants um, and their mentors. Um, and, and that's really, so if, if there's, um, I know there's uh, been a lot of questions being asked um, whether they can have access to this. Um, in terms of having the mentoring, um, they don't have the access to it, um, but the, um, the uh, speaker slots will be available on, on YouTube. So later on, um, if uh, uh, partic participants find this uh, very helpful, we will definitely be able to open up to um, a bigger crowd. So that's the other thing I just wanted to give an explanation in terms of why this particular workshop is not really a big uh, workshop. It's very um, small in terms of its group. Thanks, thanks, uh, Narakuza, for uh, giving me the platform. Okay, um, thank you, um, Dr. Tohaira. So uh, for the next uh, session, uh, we will disperse to the respective mentors and um we do not we don't have to reconvene back so uh so today is finished as you finish with um your mentors so you can uh, go off for the day lah. um so we will see you again um tomorrow for day two of the program which will start at 8 30 uh, 8 30 a.m for the next talk and I think the next mentoring session tomorrow so um, please do go to your respective mentors and um Afterwards, you can go off um, uh, straight away after you finish with your mentors. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Please don't forget to fill in your attendance, yeah?